Can you hear me? And Jane, can you hear me? Welcome to our, our webinar, Remote Working and Audiology Services During COVID-19 and Beyond. Um, we are going to be um, doing for the next hour um, this webinar. Just before we begin, however, what we want to do is a very quick two poll questions to find out how you right now are using or whether or not you are using remote care. So Anne-Marie is going to press some buttons and hopefully on your screen, I don't really know how it works, but Anne-Marie is going to get it started. And then we will go ahead. Polls. Cool, I see you all answering the first question. <laughs> I'm going to let Anne-Marie stop it when she thinks everybody's uh, answered, and then we'll move on to the next one. So we've moved on to the second question now. Okay, Gabby, we've got the results for those now, which we'll share at the end. So the poll is closed. So can you now see my screen again, the first screen? Yeah. Good. Okay, so let's move on. So what's going to be happening to today? Well, originally we had considered that this uh, webinar would be a time for you to share your thoughts and ideas about the remote care documents that are on the BAA website. Uh, but then we did a poll yesterday to find out what people wanted to learn about. And um, of the 83 of you who replied, we learned the following, that basically almost 90% of you want to hear about example pathways for remote care, with over 50% of you wanting to learn about suitability for remote care. And then there were another 40% of you who were also interested in the principles of teleaudiology and accessibility. So. We're going to focus the webinar today on these things. That doesn't mean we don't want to hear back from you about those remote care documents, and we will encourage you to do so. And on the BA website, there are um, the email addresses for uh, Anne-Marie and I that you can contact us with your questions. And we've also got another uh, webinar scheduled for two weeks' time that you can join. And at that time, we'll decide whether or not we want to focus it on those documents or on other things and we'll communicate with you in the interim to decide that. Um, so this is what we're going to do today. Uh, we've really got a packed schedule and I need to keep an eye on the time. Uh, but basically I'm going to do a short introduction to telehealth. Uh, then Anne-Marie is going to cover and um, some other colleagues are going to cover some other examples um, of the topics that we said we cover. And then at the end we'll come back to those poll results of the questions that we just asked. So how's it going to work? Well, you all figured out you're all on mute and you're going to have to remain on mute all of the time. Uh, but we do want questions and comments. So you should use the question box. I, I said chat, but it's called question in this uh, software. So at any time, enter your questions into the chat. Uh, the chat, we see the questions. And so what we will do is we as the organizers will moderate the Q&A. Um, and then our slides will be available afterwards if you are interested in them. Um, I know it would be nice if we could be a bit more interactive, but there are a lot of people on the call, so it would get absolutely chaotic if we tried to sort of put hands up and have a free-flowing conversation. So that's why we'll have to do it like this. All right, so coming on. I said I'd do a few minutes on the principles of telehealth, and I just have a few slides on that. So first of all, what are we talking about today? Well. You'll hear all these terms, telemedicine, telehealth, telepractice, remote care, e-health, telecare, probably more, and then, of course, teleaudiology. And for the most part, the terminology is used interchangeably. I'm sure someone somewhere has 
differentiation between these subtle terms, but essentially, I would, if I were you, think of it all under the same umbrella. And so what is telehealth? So telehealth is the use of communication technologies to provide and support healthcare at a distance. So if you think about it, we have been using telecommunications technologies for many, many years. We've been at the most simple level, having a phone call, patient reports what problems they have, and then it's decided what kind of appointment they need. So I want to point out an important thing, that this telemedicine, telecare is not a separate, special uh, a separate medical speciality. It's really just an adaptation of how we deliver healthcare. Therefore, we don't need to go about proving that the medical interventions work if we're doing telehealth, telecare properly. And what I mean by that is that if you have a successful telehealth practice, the health outcomes that you obtain must meet the health outcomes you would obtain if you did it face to face. There's no particular reason to think they would exceed it in terms of the health outcomes. I could think of a few examples where they might. But what is key is that it's equivalent to face-to-face -to -face care. If it's not equivalent, there is a problem in what you're doing. So there are you know, many, many studies that go out there for audiology that say, well, can we do pure tone audiometry remotely? And right now, that's very hard without specially calibrated headphones. So one would have to say, no, we can't measure hearing thresholds remotely very well yet. On the other hand, there are plenty of things that say if you program cochlear implants remotely and hearing aids remotely, outcomes are equivalent. And why wouldn't they be? I mean, one might argue, in fact, they could be superior because if you're programming the hearing aid in the person's own listening environment, they could well be superior to your doing it in a soundproof booth in the clinic. So that's the first point. But it's also possible that consumer related outcomes, so things like patient satisfaction, how much it costs them to attend the appointment in terms of time and money, how much access they have, the clinical efficiency on your end, these outcomes could be actually superior to routine face-to-face -face care. And so we sort of have to make sure that we, we maintain that balance between health outcomes being the same and that we want to know that consumer-related outcomes are as good, but they may well be better. And that sort of takes me on to the next point. Um, about outcome assessment. So it is of interest to understand the health outcomes for teleaudiology versus the consumer outcomes. As in, you know, can we prove that you get the same audiological support as if you were doing a face-to-face -face appointment? But how does the satisfaction and cost and accessibility change from the face-to-face -face outcomes? And um, it would certainly be a value to the NHS, and I, it would be interesting certainly to us as researchers. Um, and I think it, I would like to think it's also interesting to you as audiologists to understand that relationship um, so that you can sort of, well, or we can document um, evidence of benefit or otherwise of teleaudiology. Um, and to that end, what um, I want to put in place is some, some way of getting some information from audiologists about your perspectives on teleaudiology um, now, and then ideally your perspectives of teleaudiology after you've tried it some more. Uh, there's not that much out there right now, but it does tend to show that people are very concerned about diving into teleaudiology. They're concerned quite legitimately about many of the factors. But on the other hand, when they've tried it, there's a certain element of reassurance that happens and they actually begin to trust it. So I would love, and I intend to work on this, to find out your perspectives before you've really tried it or when you've tried it early on in the process and then down the line. Um, I think it's also important that we get some patient perspectives. So um, I also want to work out a way that we can do some outcome measurements from our patients whether or not we put together a, a, some kind of questionnaire or survey that they get a link after they've had a remote appointment or send them an email, send them an automatic questionnaire, 
send it in the mail. Don't really know, but um, I think it's important. Um, and I think it would be good. I, I don't want to quite use the word reassurance. I'd like to think it would be a reassurance that we would get positive outcomes, but it would be evidence for you one way or the other of your teleaudiology practice. So that's one aspect of um, assessment that I do want to work it um, into things. I'm just checking the time out there. I've got a couple of minutes left. Okay, so I'm just going to um, mention, hopefully by now all of you are aware of the uh, set of documents to, um, to guide remote working that um, MANCAD and BEA put together. Um, it was a joint um, effort and the, the names of people who were involved are listed here. Um, uh, if you want to go to those documents, if you already have them, there's a link there. And we made these documents up so you can look at each one independently or you can read them as a set. And there are six different documents. Uh, we've got a literature review. We've got a very practical guide to remote care, which addresses the things that I've got here, accessibility, managing assessing risk, me measuring outcome, confidentiality and consent, and some links to NHS guidance. We've also got in the document three, some checklists. Um, and we had somebody actually ask us, can they send out the checklist as is to patients? Absolutely, that's why we did it. It kind of lists how the patient should set up their space at home with the camera and the sound and, and lots of um, recommendations for how to optimize everything at their end. And then we've got an equivalent one for clinicians. So I suggest you take a look at that. And then the last four are basically guidelines for adult pediatric and vestibular services. Uh, so that is what we have available. Um, at this point, I think there is about one minute for questions. Um, but if there isn't anything important, I suggest we just hand over to Anne-Marie and let her take over. So we've not had any... Um... <clears throat> well, in which case, I think you should take over because... Yeah, okay, great. So can, can Victoria, can you enable me to share? Because I can't, still can't share at the moment. Just while that's happening, I'll just share a question that we've had. Um, I'll try and send it to all about. Has everybody seen that question? Distance in between staff. Mm. Just for people to think about. So um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to share my screen. It's still grayed out at the moment. Emory, I'm sorry, I can't make you a presenter. I'm just trying to, but. It's not okay, no, that's fine. I don't. Oh, well, here we go. There we go. Sorry. Done. Uh, let me just, I can't see which your, screen I'm actually sharing. Your screen's there. It says determining suitability for remote care. Just yeah, can you see it in the, mode. in the PowerPoint form or in the screenshot form? Screen. I think it's a PowerPoint still. It's not, it's not the, re it's not the uh, presentation. It? Let me try sharing again and see if I can actually pick the screen I want to share. Oh, hang on, maybe I just need to. Um, just because it's on my other screen, you say, oh, I'll just have to do it on here, I think. Okay. <clears throat> so, one of the um, categories we put down was about determining suitability, and that really relates to this guidance that came out on the 1st of May about the pathways, how do we decide who's suitable for remote care and who's suitable for clinic. And actually, the choice isn't clear cut. <clears throat> it's likely that some people will have a combination pathway. So we're going to talk a little bit about generic pathways today and some quite specific pathways. The decision for the pathway is actually quite complex. It involves different factors. And when we were putting together the guidance, it became apparent that there was kind of these five different elements that made the decision. And all these elements can be measured and assessed and recorded for each patient. And it's possible that you might have a kind of um, use different options for the different things that you're trying to measure. And then you make a decision about whether that person is more suitable for a virtual clinic or whether they're more suitable for um, a face to face appointment. And it might be that the person does have the equipment available, but they just don't have the um, they've never used the apps before. So they don't have experience of that. So it might be that a big part of it is supporting them in terms of using the apps. And actually, Age Concern do some really great information on this. Family can be really useful for this as well. And it might be that people just need a, some of what we do is not just about audiology. It's also about giving people support with using the technology. Um, 
patient choice is clearly really important, but they need to know exactly what they're sort of agreeing to, what's going to happen when they come into clinic, how long are they going to be there for, how long are people going to be working close to their face, things like that, that they might not, they wouldn't necessarily know otherwise. Um, and if it's done remotely, how long they'll be on remotely for, what type of tools we'll use, why we'll use them, what we can and can't do. So what's possible to document all these different decisions in terms of deciding who's suitable for remote care or who's suitable, who needs to come into the clinic. And it can be done in a very methodical way, in a very repeatable way, so that all audiologists are kind of making very similar decisions across the department, across the team. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk about accessibility. And actually Dawn's gonna help me now. So I don't know whether Dawn can hear me or whether she, Victoria, can you pass the mic to Dawn? She's gonna help me with this bit. Dawn Bramham, she's just in the normal list of attendees. So I'm Lovely, go I'm, I'm unmuted now, thank you very much. Super, um, I'll, put the, I'll put the slide on for you, Dawn. Thank you. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I work at Basildon Hospital. I'm, I'm part of the Mid-South Essex uh, uh, Conjoined Trust. And we've been doing obviously a lot of work, as everyone else has, along the guidance that's been um, put forward, which has been very helpful. And one of the things that has always sat with me is about those who can't use telehealth. Um, and that includes our staff who feel very intimidated by telehealth. So I'll just mention that in a moment. But what we've tried to do is figure out how to look after these patients, how to identify them without them feeling um, overwhelmed. Because if you do have a call from a patient and you ask them 15 different questions, they can. we find our patients can get quite flustered. So, so we don't want to increase their stress or their anxiety about it. Um, it's still a work in progress how we want to do that. Um, but in terms of what we've asked for, in terms of any funding to support our process of restart, one of those is about um, enablers or, or link uh, workers. And that comes with a, a charity that we have in Essex called Hearing Help Essex. And they're very keen to help us. Um, and so if we can get funding, they will be able to, to go to the home and enable that in uh, IT connection with them. We're using GN Resound Ambio hearing aids and um, today I actually found out there's some further developments with those which allow us to do um, remote access more like a video phone call rather than requiring downloading of an app etc. So, so it, it's making it more accessible again but also it does have a, a degree of in-situ audiometry which again is not perfect as Gabby quite rightly says, but it has a place for us. So we are going to be increasing what we are able to do remotely, but we want to make sure that we are able to capture those lovely old patients that we have that are regular, that don't really phone very well, use the phone very well. They don't have any computers. They have minimal family support around them. And if these enablers can go into the home and can sit with them, um, appropriate, appropriate safe distances, enabling them to chat with the audiologist and have it set up like a, a FaceTime conversation that, that's enabled for them. They should feel more able to, to, to be supported and, and able to use their hearing aids more effectively without having to come into the hospital, which as we all know, we have some patients who are very frightened about doing that. Those who are able to use digital um, telehealth, There'll be a, a good number of those, but I still think we need to think of those who aren't. It's it's never a clear process of what we need to do. I, re I really do think we've got a lot of work to do in how we refine this process. And for the audiologists who aren't entirely comfortable with the whole IT process, which bear in mind that our, our whole work in life has been about patient contact, um, we've, we've developed some softer guidance about what to do. Um, you know, if, if a patient's taken ill while you're doing the telehealth session, or if you've got a safeguarding issue, these are all obvious things to think about. But we've tried to make sure that there's a there's a bit of hand holding while we make sure that both sides feel comfortable with the process. And if they don't, it's not a painful process to go to a face to face appointment. We don't know when we're going to do those, but when we do it will be done and they will be able to access that appropriately. Is that okay? Yes, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
the other part of accessibility that I wanted to talk about was captions. So this is actually quite a significant problem in that the software that the NHS uses often attend anywhere has been used. There isn't live captions and actually when you share a screen, so it might be that you have captions running on your computer, but when that screen is shared with the patient, the video part of the conversation is lost. So people don't see the video, they can't lip read, they can't see demonstrations of what you're doing with the hearing aids, etc. And actually, that is the situation for a lot of different software. So I'm trying to sort of compare and contrast and look at different options about how to overcome it. One that seems quite promising is this one consultation, which was actually discussed in the heads of service meeting yesterday. They use it in Windsor because it's linked to MS Teams, because it's linked to Microsoft 365. There's potential that there's a bit more functionality with that. In terms of um, there is ways that the patient can overcome it if they use speech to text conversion, but it does require a fair amount of technical skills and it it kind of puts everything in the patient's um, responsibility and really actually is it our responsibility to provide this it is what's worrying really is that this doesn't mean that just mean that audiology isn't accessible to them it means all their healthcare NHS appointments won't be accessible to them so um, it's, it's something that as we as a profession should be really kind of pushing forward and making sure that there is this accessibility and captions are available when they have their healthcare appointments so in terms of pathways, so we have tried to keep the focus on pathways because that's what everybody wanted. And first of all, I'm going to talk about some quite generic pathways and then we're going to talk much more specifically. We didn't talk about pathways in the guidance because things are changing so rapidly. It wouldn't be appropriate at the moment. Hopefully, as this guidance evolves and as COVID um, reduces and isn't affecting our clinical care, we'll be able to have definite pathways and a more definite guidance, which I hope will be a professionally wide guidance that we all follow. But for example, at the moment, we might say that there's three pathways that I talked about at the start. We might say there's a purely clinical pathway where we triage the patient, we think there's a problem, there's evidence, there's a red flag, and then we bring them in because we know we need to see them. We need to do otoscopy, tympanometry, etc. Linking in with the recently published ENT guidance, it might be that we need to think about one-stop shop clinics we get them in and everything's done at the same time it might be that we triage them remotely but then we pass it over to our colleagues in vestibular or tinnitus and they might continue the triage remotely before they bring them in um, and and just consideration for patients that can't self-report this is the group that's at much higher risk potentially and we are going to talk about those a little bit today that group Probably the most likely pathway that we, we, we is going to be useful is this kind of combination pathway. So where we triage them initially, there's no kind of obvious red flags. We do a full needs assessment potentially over the video to see what they're struggling with, what they need. And then at that point, we have to decide, can we support them remotely with their needs or do they need to do we need to have a hearing test? Do they need the hearing aid updated? Do they need a hearing aid to be fitted? Because if they do, the options in terms of assessment are quite limited at the moment. There are options like in situ audiometry, which hopefully we can discuss more. There's options that's used in America with a HearX kit, which I'm sure you've all heard about. And there's a really good paper in the hearing journal from Duet Sonipol, and he talks about how that can be used in a no touch pathway. So you're not touching or coming into contact at all with the patient. But obviously there's limitations in terms of it only does air conduction, there's no bone conduction, no masking. So in terms of a pathway where we bring them in, we do the test and then it goes back out to remote care again, it means that we're going to have a short appointment time. So we're going to be able to fit more people into clinic. It's going to limit the contact time to make it safer. The video appointments are going to be a much more relaxed situation to support counselling. Um, the video means we can demonstrate and share and also we family can join in that wouldn't be able to be there otherwise exactly how this pathway works is going to depend on your patient it might be that if you have to take an impression you might decide that and um, you might decide then that you're actually going to do an RECD so that you can use that when you do the post or fitting it might be that you decide that that person isn't going to be able to access remote care so you actually decide to do the fitting on that day and open fit whether you do a REM or not but for each sort of step at that point it's going to be thinking about the risk potential risk to that patient versus the potential gain that could could occur so people who've got abnormal shaped ear canals people who've had ear surgery in the past people who can't self-report on how the hearing aid sounds younger children these are all going to be people that actually are going to get a much more benefit from having that face-to-face um, appointment compared to having it done remotely so there's lots kind of lots of decisions to be made 
And then the final pathway that I'm going to talk about is a complete remote pathway. So this is where we're really going to look at what we can do to support the patient away from the clinic. We're not going to bring them in. Example of a very high risk child, so they, they wouldn't want to come into clinic. And this is almost like switching the pathway around. So we're going to do we're going to do the ectoscopy and PTA and everything else, but we're going to do everything we can remotely before we move over to that. And it, potentially this could be used for adults, for children. We try to put in some tools and apps that could be useful to support this type of pathway. Um, and we've got a little bit about uh, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, which Siobhan has put together. Is Siobhan here? Let me see. Uh, Cause she did have a clinic, so she may be here or she may not be able to be here. No, I can't see her. So Siobhan has, um, is, is within our committee and she's been looking at this very specifically about how do you ensure that people who have um, an intellectual disability are also are put onto the right pathway. Um, and actually, this self-report can be quite difficult to determine whether somebody can self-report accurately. And it might be that the initial triage, it might not be picked up, that that self-report is difficult. And it's when you do the more detailed assessment, including key workers, family members that can kind of support that process. Um, I think it's really interesting that their local community have said that they would prefer not to come into hospital um, and actually be seen in a separate site. And that's what they're setting up at the moment. Um, And then Siobhan's also shared some information around uh, procedures for remote healthcare for people with a learning disability. And I've actually, we've actually added that onto the documents within this um, meeting. So hopefully you'll be able to download that directly. Um, but this is an area that certainly we're going to sort of look at within the guidelines and kind of look to support as well. So next, Adam's going to talk about his pathways a little bit. Can you join us, Adam? Are you not on the webinar? <laughs> I don't know. Unmute me. Yeah, you're on now. You're on. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, so this, um, I, I first of all, I just want to say that, that we don't have any special um, magic here in Plymouth that other people in, across the country aren't doing um, so and, and I'm, I'm very aware that people are probably doing things better than we are because we're all making it up as we go along um, so this is what we, we've started now we've changed things about 25 times in the last two months um, as I suspect everyone else has as well um, so this is where we're at for our fittings now for adults so we found that just by phoning people cold and inviting them to a video appointment um, our take-up was really, really low. People were really scared of doing that. So we're sending people that are kind of our standard or, or updated invite letter with the, the leaflet all about how the video consultations work, the attend anywhere. Um, so they've got time to look at it, think about it, ask their family members and so on. And we're finding that take-up has got much higher as a result of that. Um, so we then do a, a fairly short appointment. This is for people, as says, who've already got their all, um, audios where we'll go through the choices of their hearing aid, um, different models, colours, what setup they're going to have, programmes and so on, and then we post the aids and all the information, links and so on. Um, quite a hefty pack. Um, and then we have an appointment a week afterwards where we do the whole going through actually how to use the hearing aid insertion, control, hygiene, all those things that you would do and a video or telephone follow-up uh, four weeks later. We're using um, the Ambio aids and we've got the remote assist, which we had an agreement for just before all this kicked off. Um, so we're finding that remote fine tuning is really, really, really beneficial for those people who need it, particularly um, it just keeps that, that footfall away. So um, that's been really successful so far. Uh, our face-to-face -face fitting appointments will be for those people that can't do this and, and I'm very conscious that and we've had long conversations about tr uh, equality of access and at the moment that's kind of a little bit out of the window but we are um, making sure that we will be doing face-to-face -face appointments for those people that can't access the video service um, 
I was also asked to talk a bit about children. So we set up at the same time as we started doing our remote care, um, a pathway for glue ear children. We had no real intention of bringing those in at, uh, at that stage, um, but there were children who were clearly struggling at home who were waiting for hearing aids. And we set up a system where we did that by phone call with the families, programming up either um, BT aids using um, predicted RECDs or BAHAs on soft bands, sending them those through the post and then going through that with a family a week afterwards and making sure that was working. And we've done a, uh, a fairly small number of those, but I think quite successfully um, as well. I have shared to the organisers at our SOP, our original SOP for that, it, it needs updating, it's out of date at the moment, but um, just to give people a bit of guidance on that. And um, someone's asked if I'll share the leaflet we send out. We send out, um, I can share this, the kind of the letter that we send as part of our just invite and the, the leaflet is a, the trust standard one for Attend Anywhere and I'm sure I can share that without any difficulties um, at all, um, without anyone getting upset with me. Um, as I say, it's, it's just kind of things we've been inventing as we go. What we are looking at doing, and I'm sure we're not going to be alone in this, is, is as we start getting a, a reasonable number of follow-ups though, is, is really auditing how this is working and trying to improve it as we go. Um, I think I'll stop there really. Thank you, Adam. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I know you've given loads of information and it is really useful just to see how everybody's doing it. And we've actually added your um, paediatric glue ear protocol as a handout today so that people can access it straight away. And I've put here at the end, some, there's a few different resources around the BWA website, so I've kind of linked them all together at the end so people know where to find things. So we're going to move on now to talk about vestibular pathways. And we've got Debbie Kane joining us. Can you hear us, Debbie? Yes, I can. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie. Yes, um, just like Adam said, I think I want to uh, sort of reiterate that, especially for vestibular patients, there is no one correct pathway. So I've just thrown together some, some ideas here. Of course, um, we can't do a caloric over the phone, but we can do a very effective um, history over the phone. Um, so that's always um, a, a good idea to, to see whether or not your history is, is um, sort of mirroring your triage uh, initial um, sort of letter and, and, and hospital notes. So I think there's a number of different routes that you can go. You get your referral letter and that may be of varying quality and content. Um, it might be then a good idea to, to sort of further triage them. And you could do this in a number of different ways. You, you could do this by sending uh, the patient a questionnaire. So there's an abbreviated Disney's questionnaire by Roland, for example. You could phone them. You could Skype them. Um, I guess the easiest thing to try and do would be to sort of try and differentiate them into sort of our BPV patients and our other patients, um, non-BPV, but vestibular patients. Another thing to do is to think actually in this time, do they actually, and this is a little bit controversial, do they need full testing? Or from your triaging, um, could you start vestibular rehabilitation um, before they have testing or start it because you're fairly confident in the diagnosis? Um, now that might be a bit controversial and you definitely want to sort of okay that with the um, referring source because they will have referred for testing um, for a particular reason. But we are, I know, building ourselves up lots of patients who need testing. And actually, you might want to ask yourself, is testing going to change your ultimate management? You might just get referrals in for vestibular rehabilitation. And I think this can be quite um, effectively remotely done. Um, you can give them a sort of tailored plan via Skype or over the phone, or there's generic resources of both um, booklet-based and web-based um, information that I've given under the remote guidance um, document. I quite like giving tailored plans and making sure people are okay with them and they're not, uh, they're not too difficult for the patient or putting the patient at risk, but I do acknowledge that that's not going to be um, possible for, for all. Of course, we do always need to make sure that we're not putting our dizzy patients at risk of falling. So we need to be particularly careful with our older generation. Um, 
when it comes to BPPV, then can we um, go on to the BPPV slide? So yes, I mean in our clinic we have we have two types of patients. We have patients who are returning, uh, so their BPV is returned, and we have new patients with with BPV. Um, now I was increasingly thinking that, especially with our returners, that patients we may be able to sort of treat them almost entirely at home by getting patients to self treat. I've tried this a little bit over the last few weeks, and of course this would always be the patient's choice, and a large number, of, well, the, the patients that I've seen, quite a lot of them said, actually, no, we'll wait for you because we're a bit scared of bringing on that dizziness. Having said that, I have had um, one young patient who was very keen to self-treat at home. I got, I sent him an information leaflet and a video, and we both sort of tested him and treated him at home. So that definitely, for those who want to do that, um, is an option. There was a very good question put to me this morning, though, um, about what happens if it goes wrong and who is liable. So if a patient does a self-test um, or treatment and then falls off their bed or becomes very dizzy, who is liable? Now, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I think um, one needs to contact one's own trust a, about that and without a doubt get consent in a way that, a pa uh, in a way that your trust is, is happy to get consent. Um, could you use this model for patients for whom you've triaged from your, your testing and, and also test and treat? That could potentially um, be possible. Uh, but again, that's a little bit more dicey because you've never seen them um, before in the past. Um, so I, I think there is no one right model. Once you get your referral letter, either for um, test for the stimulus assessment or rehabilitation, um, trying to triage them in to more appropriate groups? Do they need testing at all? Do they need partial testing? Could we test and treat at home? Um, could we just give a stibular rehabilitation um, without testing? Might be a useful thing to do. And you can do that in a number of different ways. But it all really depends on your individual patients, on what equipment and resources you have in your hospital and your staff and your number of patients that you have in your uh, waiting for for um for testing and treatment so there is no one right model of course just a quick word on testing we do get incredibly close to our patients with our calorics with our head impulse with our bpv so we have been advised um, by the baa then to wear full protective um gear um, we need to think about um uh, our VNG goggles and whether you've got a single use iPad or um, something that can't be disposed of and cleaned properly. And so there are a few issues here and the, the British Society of Audiology Balance Interest Group are looking into this uh, in terms of um, important infection control um, guidance and they're hoping to submit that guidance at the same time of the revision of the face-to-face um, -face guidance, working guidance documents. So they are looking at that. But be very careful about infection control for when you do test. I think that's about all. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm sort of trying to keep a view on the questions as we do it, see whether there's anything specifically vestibular. Can you see the questions as well, Debbie? I can't know. Yeah, it's a bit so tricky one, to one, one more thing was that uh, as well, the, the lady who, who emailed this morning about litigation type things also asked about, um, you know, good resources for videos and handouts because she's absolutely right. There's a lot of very poor um, videos on YouTube. So you do not want your patient to go and Google um, an Epley manoeuvre or something like that. You want to find an Epley manoeuvre video or make one yourself that you're happy with and also um, have it in a handout as well. And you may even be able to sort of be there whilst the patient is doing that manoeuvre. And I would always suggest having a second person there to um, help that person who's doing the test or the treatment. 
Okay, brilliant. We are keeping a track of all the questions, so if we don't get to them today, we definitely can answer them. And everything we discussed today is going to help us when we're updating these documents to make sure we're putting in what people need to know and things. So thank you very much, Debbie. I really appreciate that. We're going to move to Jane now. Jane Bevan that works in Chester. Can you can we can you join us, Jane? Hi, yeah. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So um Thanks for asking me to talk. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of the pathway we're using for our, our tinnitus patients at Chester. Just to echo the sentiments from, from Debbie and Adam, we're definitely not experts um, and we have had lots of trial and error in, in terms of how this pathway is, is, has changed. Um, so this is what we're currently doing. Um, so all of our tinnitus patients are referrals from ENT. So all of these patients will have already had a hearing test, um, they would have had a toscopy, and they would have been referred to us by ENT. Um, and we would normally have seen them for a face-to-face -face tinnitus assessment. Obviously, that's not possible. So what, we, um, what we're doing is we're sending out a... Um, a tinnitus pack. Um, that pack I've listed on the, the slide there, sort of a, a, a summary of what that pack includes. Um, so that gets that sent to the patient. Um, um, inside that pack is a, a sort of an explanatory letter just to let the patient know that the, the tinnitus assessment that they've been referred for will be going ahead, but obviously in a, in a remote way rather than face to face. And it just lets them know that um, we're going to be contacting them to, to sort of do that remote assessment. Um, we usually leave them with a pack for one to two weeks um, and then we contact them by phone to check they've first of all that they've received the pack and to arrange a suitable time to do that remote session. Now that remote session might be by phone or it might be by video. So we, we you know, we give the patient preference for that. Um, we advise them to prepare for their remote assessment by being in a quiet, comfortable location where they can talk. Um, we explain how the video assessment will work. Um, and we also let them know that they don't need to download anything prior to that. So initially, when we put sort of um, devise this pathway, um, we didn't contact them um, to prearrange the, the the remote session. We were kind of doing more like a cold call where we would sort of contact them to arrange it. Um, so, sorry, to actually do the assessment. And what we found when we, we did that, that none of the patients were happy to do a video call without some prior um, notification that we were going to do that. We also tried um, in another version of this pathway, sending them a text message um, sort of about an hour before to see if that would would help. Um, but again, when we did that, none of that that was successful either. So what we found is doing that sort of um, phone call to prearrange a suitable time for the virtual appointment worked much better. And with that process, much uh, a much higher number of patients were happy to do um, a video call. We currently it's about 65% of patients opting to do the the tinnitus assessment by video call rather than phone. I don't know whether that is is potentially affected by the fact that the, the tinnitus patients that we are we're including in this pathway perhaps a slightly younger demographic. Um, some patients are reluctant to use video calls that could be because um, they're just not keen on the idea or they just don't have the technology required so in those in those situations we we just arrange the phone assessment rather than a, a video call um, we've seen a much higher number of patients not wanting video calls with other remote pathways that we're using so for example our fitting pathways um, there's definitely less take up of the video call option so at Chester we're using the Accurex Fleming platform um, if you're not familiar with it it's quite easy to use in, in that anyone can access it um, if you have an NHS email account um, and also the patient doesn't need to download anything it's just the link that gets sent through that they click on and that just brings up the video screen so all you really need is is a webcam um, set up uh, at both ends really um, so on the day of the assessment you send the invite directly to their mobile device um, or in some cases we've sent the link to email addresses um, and then patients can either use it on their mobile or their tablet or laptop um, the Accurex system itself allows you to send the link to a mobile phone. Um, we haven't found a way to directly send the link to an email address, so we've kind of come up with a, a sort of slightly long-winded way of doing that ourselves via NHS mail. Um, it might be that you can do that um, directly, it's just that we haven't quite figured that, that part of it out ourselves. Um, the downside of the Fleming system is there is no caption system. I think Amber mentioned that before. So far, we haven't really had any problems communicating using the, the Accurex Fleming platform. However, 
I would say a lot of the patients that we're contacting through this pathway with our tinnitus patients either have normal hearing or or mild to, to moderate hearing loss. So perhaps that's not that surprising. I think captions would be useful, um, but but so far we've sort of managed we've managed without, um, which has been which has been fine. So in terms of um, the, the pathway then, so we complete the assessment remotely at the agreed time by phone or or using the accurate system, and then. There's a few different options after that. So for some patients, we can just discharge them. So there, there are there are patients that, that are happy with the information we've sent. Um, you know, we've gone through everything at the at the assessment appointment, and they are happy to be discharged. And out of all of the, the assessments that we've done in this way, we've discharged 49%, um, so almost half. So those patients won't require any further appointments with us. Um, so we've managed to you know to reduce our waiting list from that perspective. Um, for the patients that we, we haven't discharged, some of them um, we've arranged to see um, sort of further follow up remotely, whether that's phone or video, um, they'll be added to, to the relevant waiting list. Uh, there will be some patients that, that we've identified that do need some face to face follow up um, and they'll be added to the, to the relevant waiting list for when that's, that's possible. Um, for patients that have literally no form of technology at home um, to be able them to, to enable them to download apps um, or don't have any other way of listening to sound therapy, then we um, we do have the option of sending them a, a sound ball th out through the post. Um, we bought a few of those, uh, but so far we've only actually sent two of those out, um, out of um, just over 40 patients that we've seen. And then for patients where we've identified them as potential candidates for a sound generator or hearing aids, um, then we, we, we have another pathway for a postal fitting service and, and we can add them to that and, and, and they can have that sent out as well. Um, so, so far, around about 45% of the patients that we've seen for remote tinnitus assessments um, have had some sort of hearing aid and or sound generator uh, program po uh, posted out to them. Um, in terms of uh, sort of the pathway, I suppose that it, it is something that you sort of have to sort of start and try. And, and I think just to echo what Debbie and Adam have said is there's no perfect way of doing it. And, and you, you also have to sort of work within the constraints of, of, of the setup that you have. We don't have any specialist equipment or any specialist um, remote working software. We, we're just using Accurex at the moment because that is possibly one of the easiest ones to sort of access but certainly are looking into other systems that might have a bit more functionality um, than the Accurex platform. Um, just to quickly um, just to sort of credit uh, Adam Lloyd who's our adult therapies leads at Chester um, and the Tinnitus Working Group have done all the hard work on this. Super Jane thank you so much I really appreciate it. No problem. <clears throat> Okay, so we've, we've had quite a few questions and I think they're kind of being answered as we go along. Um, we have had a few paediatric ones and I know we've got Adam and Sam who are both paediatric audiologists here, so it could be a good time. Because And also in the survey we had a lot of interest around paediatric pathways and that's something that we really need to kind of consider carefully. Um, so there was one regarding glue ear. Uh, for glue ear children, how are you determining whether the hearing is stable to fit a BTEA2? Could you say anything about that, Adam or Sam? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. As long, I think I'm, I'm muted again. Um, they, these currently are people who we've already listed for BTE, so they've had glue ear for a, a while. But we, we do load quite a lot of hearing aids for glue ear anyway, um, and and it is always a bit of a risk because glue ear can get better, um, obviously. Um, but in general, the gain's quite low, so I think the risk at the current climate isn't any isn't significantly different from how it was before. Um, okay. I guess, you know, that might come and bite us on the arse later. Um, and just to say, I, I only dabble in paediatrics. I mainly do adults, so um, I'm, I'm not going to pretend I've got any exp great expertise in this. OK, thanks, Adam. Have you got anything to add, Sam? Can you just repeat the question, Anne-Marie? Was it just about yeah. aging Louis? Yeah, it's about yeah, how you know um, we have quite successfully fitted quite a few bone conductor aids on 
um, hard bands and soft bands. Um, and I know there's been quite a big discussion about people fitting Bajas. Obviously, the cost of Bajas makes them prohibitive. But we've actually done a couple of remote fittings of um, bone conductor aids where you can't over amplify. So I think that's a good option to consider at a time like this. OK, great. Thank you. Um, there's another question regarding there's lots of interesting questions which we will be able to answer some of them are going to take a bit of thinking about um again for pediatrics after you've sent the hearing aids via the post and you've explained it all when do you do your follow-up phone call and what do you actually cover in that and do you do any questionnaires alongside it uh, at the moment we're doing our first follow-up about one to two weeks after um, which is quite short um, partly because we don't know what's going to be happening four weeks from now. Um, in theory, we would be doing the peach um, for the for the older for the slightly older children. I, I'm not certain how rigorously we're doing it. Okay, thanks, Adam. Has and another question: Has anyone done a video call, including a third party, for example, with an interpreter or a teacher of the deaf? No, I'll take that as a no. No, so, not yet. <laughs> so the video calling is really useful for that. It's a real potential to include lots of family members and lots of different professionals in there. But I guess we're still kind of right at the start of using video and trying to really explore what it can do. Um, so there's no more questions. Oh, hang on. What, what bone conductor aid do you fit, Sam? We've had a few of that. Uh, What's it called? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, Sam, your colleague here. is saying it's Brookoff. So yeah, Brookoff, bone conduction on supply chain. Okay, great. So it could be a good time to go to the results of the polls. Victoria, are you able to show that or is that something that I would do? I can just do it now for you. Want to go to the first one? Are you using remote video consultations? They... Shall I stop my sharing? No, you shouldn't need to. There you go. There's your results. Okay, great. So a lot of people have got set up with videos. That's great because um, there is a lot of technology to get in place in order for it to be used. Lots of some often computers need to be updated. Uh, and there's some implant work going on as well. That's great. And we'll check this again in a couple of weeks when we um, hopefully do another webinar so we can see how things have changed. Um, Paediatrics and vestibular are, are still quite low at the moment. So we'll see whether that changes. How do we show the poll, the next results for the next one? That's it now for you, hold on. Thank you. There you go. Okay, brilliant. So there are lots of potential tools and apps and technology that can be used. And we have, that's one thing that we did try to put into the document. So we weren't telling you how to use it. We were just kind of explaining what was available. Um, and it could be that certain apps, um, you might use them and then you could feed back on how effective they are with different populations. And then it might be that we can update that in terms of the new guidance. Um, have you got anything to add, Gabby, at this point? Um, no, not really. I, th I think what would be interesting to me is to find out when it's being used, why, and when it's not being used, why. So, you know pediatrics versus adult is it just what's out there or is it concerns that people have about working with pediatrics remotely <laughs> that's what i would like to access with a with, with an outcome questionnaire of sorts what people's reservations are and i think it's really interesting that um patients don't seem overly keen straight off but if you sort of phone or send a letter saying well would you like to give it a go then they're they're more keener and I've definitely done a few vestibular rehabilitation phone calls. And then I've sort of said, well, you know, it'd be really good to see you in the flesh and to sort of give you a bit more of a tailored plan with me seeing what you're doing. And once you've spoken to them first, they seem more keen to sort of get on board with that. So sort of introducing them gradually, if you're seeing them over a few appointments, might be 
might be the mm. way to go. Okay, super, thank you. Um, is my screen still being shared, Victoria? It is now. Yeah, super. So just, just to kind of finish off, you know, when Gabby and I started this project, we, we just wanted to form a group of resources that professionals could use. So we weren't all doing exactly the same thing, trying to set up remote care. So it would save us time, make it more efficient, a really good way to share best practice. Um, and we hope, and that's why we plan the webinars and that's why we plan the document to be updated and to, to just kind of change and evolve. There's been lots of really good resources within BAA at the heads of service meetings and I've specifically listed here the different sections so it's easy to find in the recordings when people have talked about how it works in their services. The board have put together some really useful remote working tables just in terms of all the different hearing aid options for NHS, independent sector, all the different video platforms as well. Um, 